Good morning, everyone, and welcome to EDP and Applied Mathematics Seminar. It's a pleasure for me to open session 67 of this seminar. Today, we have two excellent speakers, Carlos Kenny and Francisco Gansé. Introducing Carlos Kenny, we have to Professor Felipe Linari. Thank you, Felipe. You can start. Okay, thank you, Juan. Uh, this is always a, a great pleasure to introduce uh, uh, today's first speaker. It's then also a pleasure and an honor to introduce Carlos Kenny from the University of Chicago. So I have to tell that uh, Carlos is uh, uh, one of the best uh, analysts of his, his generation. He has uh, more than 300 publications, almost uh, 15,000 citations, more than 100 collaborators, 25 or more PhD students. And besides of all of that, Carlos has been working uh, as a service uh, as a for the, for, for the mathematical community in the last uh, years. Uh, he was president of the scientific committee of the uh, ICM in Seoul. He is uh, he's, uh, almost ending his uh, chair as the uh, president of the International Mathematical Union. And so he has a, a very tough work uh, last year, uh, trying to put forward the ICM that it was supposed to be in St. Petersburg. But uh, well, with a lot of work, Carlos finished a, a, great, a great job there. And well, uh, I have to tell you what uh, Carlos is going to talk today about. And he's going to talk about uh, channels of energy. Uh, go ahead, Carlos. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the very kind introduction. Uh, so let's just, okay. Hmm. Let me see, this isn't moving forward. Let me see what I can do. Let me redo the share. Okay. The, the soliton resolution conjecture for nonlinear dispersive equations uh, predicts that any global in time solution of this type of equation, let's say in energy critical settings, evolves asymptotically as a sum of decoupled solitons, a radiative term, which is typically a linear solution, and a term that tends to zero in the energy space. This uh, conjecture arose in the 1970s from numerical simulations and from which also gave rise to the theory of integrable equations. The, the first results in this direction were for integrable cases like the correct de Vries equation, the modified correct de Vries equation, the cubic nonlinear Schrodinger equation in one dimension. And in the, uh, the results followed by using the inverse scattering method, which was developed simultaneously to all of this and it was closely linked to all of this. Uh, after that, uh, perturbative results uh, for solutions close to a soliton were obtained still in integrable settings. And then for some parabolic pro problems in which there's a, of course, a preferred time direction, uh, also in non-integrable settings uh, were obtained. After that, the next results were below the ground state with optimal size constraints. And this uh, came in a series that uh, 
Frank Merrill and I did in the period 2006 to 2008. In these works, uh, we understood that rigidity theorems of the classical Newville type for that we all learn in complex analysis, but which classify something that we call non-radiative solutions are crucial to understand the asymptotic dynamics of semilinear dispersive equations. So let me turn now to a specific example, the energy critical nonlinear wave equation. So I wrote it here. You have the Dalham version of U that equals to a nonlinear term, and it's a U to the four over N minus two in absolute value times U. And the space variable, let's say, is in Rn, and time is in R. And we are interested in the initial value problem, <coughs> where uh, u d t u at time zero is u zero u one, and this is energy critical. So we work in the energy space, the space of functions with gradient in L two cross L two functions, and we call this Hilbert space H. Now uh, the, this uh, equation is called critical for the energy because there's a critical scaling in, in H and in the space of solutions. If you take a, a real parameter, a positive real parameter lambda, and you rescale a space by one over lambda and time by one over lambda, and you uh, multiply by the scaling factor one over lambda to the N minus two over two, if U is a solution, U lambda is still a solution. And if you calculate the initial uh, data for u lambda and its norm in the energy in a, the space H is the same for all lambda. And this is what makes the equation energy critical. This uh, family of uh, energy critical nonlinear wave equations are not integrable. So they are not amenable to the inverse scattering methods. But uh, what we realized in uh, the work we started with Merrill in the uh, mid-2000s was that there's a, a decoupling that can be made, which is related to the finite speed of propagation that uh, wave equations verify. Typically, for this uh, Liouville type theorem, one would like to show that all non-dispersive or non-radiative solutions are solitons. So these are the, the non-dispersive or non-radiative uh, solutions are what we call non-linear objects because they're objects that uh, arise as a consequence of the non-linearity. They're not present in the linear situation. And uh, more or less the Liouville theorems uh, tend to postulate that all nonlinear objects have to be solitons. Now, a first notion of a nonlinear object is the, a non-dispersive solution. And these are the solutions with the compactness property in time. What are those? Those are solutions whose trajectory in time is pre-compact in the space H up to the invariances of the equation, up to the modulations given by invariances of the equation. So this concept was uh, first introduced in work of Martel and Merrill in 2000 on the correct Debris equation. And uh, later on uh, with Merrill, we, we introduced a similar concept for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. In the case of the nonlinear wave equation, we had some classification results. So these are uh, the first Liouville type theorems in this setting and their size constraints. And this uh, are in a paper with Merle from 2008. And then in the radial three-dimensional case without any size constraint in a paper with Ducaire and Merle in, in 2011. 11. Corresponding results in the non-radial case with no size constraint appear in a paper with Ducair and Merrill in 2016. However, for the soliton resolution conjecture, you care about other nonlinear objects, the so-called multi-solitons, which you can think of as a 
superposition of finitely many uh, solid dots. And to study those objects, uh, as is needed for the soliton resolution decomposition, the notion of a solution with a compactness property is insufficient. So let me now turn to uh, results uh, dealing with the uh, soliton resolution. The first results were again perturbative near the so-called ground state. The ground state has a specific formula here is given by this uh, plus or minus one over one plus x squared over n over n minus two raised to the power n minus two over two. And this is called the ground state because among the solitons is the one with the least energy. And it results near this ground state or least energy soliton uh, were obtained in works with Dukair and Merrill in 2011 and 2012. Uh, later on, uh, we were stuck and we couldn't move forward, so we decided to attempt decomposition results into solitons for well-chosen time sequences, for solutions that are bounded in the energy norm, which is a condition we assume from now on. The boundedness in the energy norm means that uh, we consider solutions in whose whole interval of existence, the H norm remains bounded. And it, it has to be said that if you have soliton resolution in the sense I described earlier, the solution has to be bounded in the energy norm. So this isn't a, a, a restriction in that sense. Uh, for solutions, uh, uh, for uh, decompositions for well-chosen time sequences, we obtained uh, the first results with Dukair and Merrill in 2012 in the radial case, in the three-dimensional case, and corresponding results for all odd dimensions were obtained by my uh, former student, Casey Rodriguez, in 2016. Uh, in the 4D radial case, uh, so that's the first even dimension for which to study this problem, uh, we obtained the decomposition for well-chosen sequences of times so with Cot, Laurie, and, and Slag in uh, 4D, and then uh, with my postdoc, Howard Gia, in 60. Uh, this were around 2016-2017. Uh, uh, then with uh, Gia, Duikair, and Merrill in 2017, we were able to obtain the decomposition in uh, low dimensions, three, four, and five, in the uh, non-radial case, but for well-chosen sequences of times. Now, uh, the results for well-chosen uh, sequences of times can be thought of as analogs of, let's say, uh, summing a series which may or may not be uh, convergent by a Cesaro means, Cesaro means of summability. But of course, we know that this is very far from the from convergence, and in this case, from the full decomposition. And uh, around uh, that time, we decided uh, that uh, we were ready to attack results on the full decomposition. Um, that is to say, to ex exhibit the soliton. Uh, this, uh, the decomposition into some of solitons, but which holds for all times, not for well-chosen times. Uh, at this time, we realized that this issue was uh, intimately tied with the problem of collision of solitons. So uh, suppose you start out, let's say, with two solitons, and you evolve for, uh, let's say, in the positive time direction, and suppose that the solitons travel with uh, different speeds. Then at some point, they will collide. And what you need to understand is what happens after the collision. What happens to, to the solution after the two solitons collided? And that's the, the problem of a collision of solitons, which goes back in this uh, context to a, an important uh, numerical simulation carried out by Zabuski and Kruskal in the mid-1960s for the Corvette-Debris equation. 
So what we understood is that in non-integrable settings, like the one we're stu studying, uh, what one has to prove that all collisions are inelastic. They're not elastic, like in the case, integrable case of KDV studied by Kruskal and Zabuski, but they produce some ra radiation. And what that means is that there's an excess carried out by a linear solution. And this limits the number of collisions that you can have because each time you collide, you produce radiation. And this means that you cannot remain bounded in the energy norm. So we first introduced this approach in the uh, paper with Ducaire and Merrill in 2013, where we established the full soliton resolution in the radial three-dimensional case for solutions bounded in the energy norm. And this was the first soliton resolution in a Hamiltonian uh, equation. Uh, this idea then was fully developed. Uh, we were quite stuck for a, a number of years, but the idea finally was fully developed in a series of papers with Ducaire and Merrill in 2019, 2020, and 2021, where uh, we proved the soliton resolution in the radial case for the energy critical wave equation in all odd dimensions. So to be more precise about this issue about the soliton uh, collision, a natural object to consider to understand this is something that we call a pure multi-soliton in both time directions. That is to say, a solution of the uh, nonlinear uh, wave equation in the energy critical case, which asymptotically, as time goes to plus infinity and as time goes to minus infinity, behaves as a sum of decoupled solitons without any radiation. That is to say the radiation term in the soliton resolution tends to zero in both times di directions for uh, pure multi-solitons. So uh, it, it was believed that for non-integral equations such as the nonlinear wave equation, collisions are inelastic and should always generate some radiation. And the first works in this direction in some specific scenarios were uh, produced by Martel and Merle in 2011 and 2015 for the generalized correct Debris equation in a non-integrable setting. And these were monumental works. And then uh, uh, by the same authors in 2018 for the nonlinear wave equation in five uh, space dimensions. And this uh, ruled out pure multi-solitons, this, this scenarios. So now to deal with this issue in the case of the general, in the general case of the nonlinear wave equation, let's say in the radial case, uh, we introduced the concept of non-radiative solution. So let me explain what those are. These are uh, solutions which are defined in the exterior of some light cone, x bigger than r plus t in absolute value, for some r positive, and they have the uh, property that as time goes to minus infinity and to plus infinity, uh, there's no energy outside of this uh, increased uh, light cone. And so that's how we define non-radiative solutions. Why is this a useful concept for the nonlinear wave equation? Because it concentrates uh, uh, the attention on the behavior outside a very wide light cone. And therefore, by using finite speed of propagation, uh, you can uh, reduce yourself to first study this for very large R in which the solutions are small and uh, they are very close to the linear equations because of finite speed of propagation. Because uh, this uh, modification doesn't affect the behavior in the inside part of the core. It doesn't take into account the behavior in the inside part of the core. 
And so that, those are the uh, non-radiative solutions. This uh, issue of non-radiative uh, solutions for the nonlinear wave equation turns out to be intimately tied to some outer energy inequalities for the linear wave equation. And uh, this is the inequality that I'm going to call dagger here. I will refer to this inequality from now on. And uh, so this is an, a lower bound for the limit as time tends to plus infinity and time goes to minus infinity of the outer energy for a solution of the linear wave equation. And uh, the conjecture is that this, uh, at these terms at infinity dominate the energy at the initial time for x bigger than r. So uh, these are, uh, so now we introduce the Hilbert space HR, whose norm is given precisely by the quantity on the right-hand side of dagger. Okay. Now uh, for uh, uh, solutions to the linear equation, this is uh, basically a, uh, a harmonic analysis question. It's a question that could have uh, been uh, posed by D'Alembert, but of course he had no reason to, to pose such a, a question. But it turns out that the validity of uh, this inequality dagger depends strongly on the dimension n. Uh, so in the case when r is zero, so where this is just the energy norm and this is just the usual uh, exterior light cone, uh, it turns out that dagger holds for all uh, odd dimensions. Uh, we proved this with Ducaire and Merle in 2012 in the three-dimensional case, and uh, we considered the first uh, dimensional, uh, the three-dimensional case, because for R positive, when n equals to three, dagger holds for all data with one exception. The one exception is the Newtonian potential, one over R in 3D. And so it holds for all uh, functions in HR, which are orthogonal to this direction. Now, it turns out that this is very good in connection with the nonlinear wave equation, because you can deal with a single exceptional direction in the linear theory by the scaling of the equation and the fact that the asymptotics of the ground state in 3D, this is the ground state in 3D, is exactly the asymptotics of the uh, Newtonian potential. And because of this, this leads to a very strong Liouville theorem, what we call a strong uh, rig rigidity theorem for the nonlinear wave equation. It says that for any positive R, the solitons and their rescalings are the only non-zero radial solutions of the nonlinear wave equation without radiation at infinity. So this is the strong Liouville theorem. And this is what led to the soliton resolution in the three-dimensional case. Now, remarkably, uh, much to our surprise after basically almost a decade of thinking about this, uh, this is false for n bigger than or equal to five. And this is in a work with Charles Collot, Duicaire, and Merle in 2022 that I'm going to discuss in a little bit. So the strong rigidity leads to the proof of soliton resolution for n equals to three. Uh, what about our inequality dagger in other odd dimensions? So here's dagger, I remind you. It turns out that uh, this uh, inequality si still holds in the radial case odd dimensional, but with an n minus one over two exceptional subspace. So when n was three, this is one dimensional, but when it's n is five, let's say this is two dimensional, 
And so there's more than one exceptional direction. And this is not sufficient to deduce as a strong uh, rigidity result for NLW in this case, using the scaling of the equation as we did in n equals to three. And this is good <laughs> because the result is false in dimension five. And I will uh, say a few words about this later on. Nevertheless, we were able to prove the soliton resolution conjecture in all uh, odd dimensions in the radial case, but the proof is more involved. It involves, first of all, <clears throat> asymptotic estimates for non-radiative solutions, which can be deduced from this inequality dagger, and related estimates, not just for solutions of the free no, a linear wave equation, but for, of another natural uh, linear equation, which is the linearized equation around the ground state W. So we, we had to do that and then use the modulation equations that come from the fact that we knew, did know the resolution for a well-chosen sequence of times, which allows you to to uh, produce modulation parameters close and to be in the situation where you're close to a multi-soliton. And uh, it, we were reduced ourselves to just non-radiative solutions. And this gave enough parameters to deal with a large dimensional subspace. This modulation uh, parameters are uh, uh, many, and so they allow us to kill off this large dimensional subspace. And this eventually led to the proof of the soliton resolution in the odd dimensional radial case. So what happens in even dimensions? Let's remind you again about dagger. This is dagger. And of course, there's even dagger when R equals zero. And uh, never, nevertheless, uh, this, uh, to my surprise at that time, this estimate is not valid in the radial case even when r equals to zero in the even dimensional case. And uh, this is uh, again uh, a harmonic analysis result. Uh, the counterexamples were produced in a paper with Kott and Schlag in 2014. And we realized that uh, the equation holds in the radial case with a finite dimensional, co-dimensional subspace for r bigger than zero, but for only half the data. And which half depends on the congruency to n to zero mod four. So for instance, uh, uh, in dimension uh, four, uh, it is this class of of data and in dimension six, it is this class of data for which it can hold modular finite co-dimensional space. Uh, so the case R equal to zero is in this paper with Cot and uh, Schlag and uh, with R positive is in a paper with uh, Ducaire, Martel and Merle in 2021 and independently was proved by Li Shen and, and Wei in, in China. In, a, in each even dimension, what happens in the cases when, the count, when the, there are counterexamples for the, in the other half of the data, the bad half of the data, is that this is a consequence of some ghost solution. This ghost solution is a singular solution, which is re resonant uh, and is non-radiative, a linear solution to the free case, but it fails to be in the energy uh, space by a logarithm. And this only happens in uh, even space dimensions. Nevertheless, and here we come to the pandemic theorem, uh, <laughs> the case n equals four was first proved uh, with Ducaire, Martel, and Merle in 2021. This was work conducted uh, via Zoom <laughs> during the pandemic. 
And it turns out that the case n equals four, we didn't know this at the time, is critical for the strong rigidity theorem that I mentioned when, uh, when n equals to three. We proved that for any r positive in the radial case of r4, solitons are the only non-radiative solutions of the nonlinear wave equation for any r. This was the main uh, uh, breakthrough result in this paper, which then allowed us to prove the soliton resolution conjecture in the radial case in full generality for dimension four. And what we were able to do is we understood the nonlinearity in dimension four is cubic. So it's very easy to, to understand what the nonlinearity does to sums and differences. And what we decided to do to take care of half the data is to separate the even and the odd part of the solution. There's a minus corresponding to minus here, missing here. And we took the even and the odd parts of the solutions and considered the separate equations. And uh, given that we have the odd nonlinearity, the n, the cubic nonlinearity in that case, we can decouple the two equations at first order. And so we did an, an analysis based on that. So let me now in the final part of the talk, it turned to a series of works, series of three papers with Charcolot, Ducaire and Merle in the year 20, finished in the year 2022. And uh, this proves the soliton resolution for the other type of uh, even dimension. When n equals to six, and uh, we managed to do that by introducing a replacement to this estimate dagger for the data that gave the counterexamples to dagger when n equals to six. Now, what are the difficulties involved? First, we need to combine the analysis of a four dimensional case with the analysis of an odd bigger than or equal to five. And those two analyses are very different. The, the difficulties are that because n is bigger than four, of course, six is bigger than four, there's a higher dimension of the set of non-radiative solutions, even of the admissible ones in the exterior wave cone for x bigger than r plus t at the at the linear level. So there's actually a two-dimensional subspace when n equals six uh, for, for the admissible ones, which are counterexamples of this form. So this fact uh, is what eventually we understood leads to the existence of non-trivial non-radiative solutions at the non-linear level, which are not solitons in these regions. And this is the failure of strong rigidity I alluded to earlier. And this is in the third of this series of papers. To, uh, uh, to rule out the possibility of this giving counterexamples to the soliton resolution, we're faced with a, what we call a, a which is generally called a reconnection problem. Because if you have a non-radiative solution, which arises from a solution in not just from R positive, but from R equal to zero, then non-radiative solutions are automatically counterexamples to the soliton resolution conjecture. Because if you have a multi-soliton, you have to have radiation. Uh, I mean, if you have a non, if you have a, a non-radiative term, you automatically you automatically eliminate the possibility of the soliton resolution because there's a radiation term, and the radiation term is killed by this. But how do you? Uh, 
how do you rule out this possibility? This is done by a huge contradiction argument, which is in this spirit of the n equals to four argument. And uh, now in, in uh, at least we had a, in the case n bigger than or equal to five odd, we, we had going for us to rule out this reconnection problem, which also arises when n is bigger than or equal to five, although we didn't really know this for a fact at the time that we came up with this argument. We don't have channel estimates uh, as in the odd dimensional case, which was how we somehow uh, ruled this out for this data. And this is uh, due to the existence of, this is the resonant direction, which in six dimensions fails to belong to the energy space by a logarithmic singularity. And the fact that this guy and its relatives exist blocks the proof of the asymptotics at infinity and the modulation analysis that we did in the, on, the, in the odd dimensional case. So the way we overcame this seemingly impossible situation is that we found a new channel of energy estimate, uh, which is, uh, remains true in uh, the even dimensional case, but which instead of being valid for the linear wave equation, it is valid in the linear wave equation associated to the linearized equation around the soliton. And so this is that equation. The potential V is minus n plus two over n over two times W to the four over n minus two. And this is the linearized equation around the ground state. So let me, uh, in the last part of the talk, explain what this, what's happening here. So for easiness of, easiness of notation, let's say, uh, define E sub out to be the limit of a solution of this uh, uh, linearized equation, which is a linear equation. And uh, recall that if, by sharp, if u is a solution of the linear wave equation, radial, let's say we stick to radial solutions here, and n bigger than or equal to three is odd, then the energy norm of the data is controlled by, by this object. But in the even dimensional case, we can only bound the the half of the data, which is the H1 norm when n equals to four, and the half of the data, which is the L2 norm when n equals to six, and the full estimate fails. Now, for the linearized equation around W, there's other counterexample functions, just like we had uh, for R positive for the linear wave equation. And here, the counterexample functions are given by the kernel of the uh, elliptic linearized operator, which is minus the Laplacian plus W, which is a very well-studied elliptic operator. And uh, the, it is known that the kernel of this in the radial case is generated by what we call lambda W, which is the, uh, given by the infinitesimal a generator of dilations applied to W. And this is, you know, you can write the formula. It's an object that decays the same way as W, but it's different from W. So I recall that in, uh, in odd dimensions, in our work on soliton resolution, part of the work was to prove in the radial case that for solutions of the linearized operator, around the W, we still had the full uh, L2 norms, projection in H1 and projection in H2, where you project to the span 
of the lambda w. And uh, when you rule out just those solutions, the kernels given by the kernel of the linearized operator, you still control the full uh, energy. For an even, this is false, just like it is for the linear wave equation, it is also false for the linearized wave equation. Uh, even for uh, uh, this kind of data, which are our forbidden data, which we somehow need to need to handle by some means. So recall that this is due to this go this failure is due to this ghost that comes from this logarithmic failure from being in the energy space. What you do then is you do a logarithmic correction to n to L2. For n equals to six, we define this z norm to be, you know, a local L2 norm at all scales, but normalized by a factor of log. And the theorem is that if you have a solution of the linearized uh, wave equation and n is six, you have the full data provided in, in the forbidden part of the data, you measure it in the Zeno. And corresponding results hold for all even dimensions, bigger than or equal to five. And with this tool, we were able to push the program combining the n bigger than or equal to five and n equal to four theorem and establish a uh, so uh, the inelastic collision of solitons and soliton resolution for n equals six and uh, modulus some technicalities for all even dimensions. And we also found a rigidity theorem, let's say in dimension five, suppose you have a radial solution of the nonlinear wave equation bounded in the energy norm, which is a global in time. Then if it is not a soliton, it has this non-radiative so, uh, behavior, but it's not for all R, it's for one R naught that depends on the solution itself. And then you have to do some translation in time depending on the solution itself. But this is enough to rule out pure multi-solitons and to prove the soliton resolution. So, uh, for completeness, let me mention that a few months after these results were posted on archive, uh, Gendridge and Laurie uh, also posted a proof of the soliton resolution conjecture, uh, which is a unified proof for all n bigger than or equal to four. Uh, somehow th their proof does not work in the three dimensional case. And, and they did this also by uh, proving an elastic collision of solitons. But their approach is not through rigidity theorems like ours, but by something reminiscent of dynamical systems, a, a no return analysis, uh, which is a, a appeared in earlier work of them in equivariant wind wave maps and was inspired by earlier works of the Geyer and Merrill Nakanishi Schlag and Krieger Nakanishi and Schlag. And, uh, with this, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlo, for the nice talk. Okay, so we open the session for questions, uh, comments. <laughs>
Maybe I make one more comment. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I think that basically for the nonlinear energy critical nonlinear wave equation and similar equations like equivariant wave maps, radial Young Mills, and so on, uh, this finishes the the study of soliton resolution in cases where there's symmetries. So, uh, uh, and it's a complete theory right now. Now, what uh, remains is the huge challenge of uh, avoiding symmetries. For instance, proving nonlinear uh, for nonlinear wave equation, let's say in, in 3D or 4D or 5D, in the non radial case, the full soliton resolution. And this is a huge, huge challenge. And uh, maybe it will take. Uh, another 15 years to do, I don't know. But it's a challenge for younger generations. Okay, thank you. Carlos, um, for other type of equation, is there any chance to, 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 to apply this kind of, I, I know saying no linear way for that family, but, uh, and, and uh, no linear dispersive equation. Yes, I, I think, so what I should say is that uh, a very interesting problem is the corresponding problem for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in, in the energy critical setting. And there, of course, here, we really relied very strongly on finite speed of propagation. And this is what's uh, missing in a, in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. That being said, there are scenarios in which people mm -hmm. have discovered energy channels in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. There's a very interesting work of Merrill and Pierre Raphael in which they find in some hidden scenario, uh, some energy channels in the nonlinear uh, Schrodinger equation. So I think that right now, the thing to try for the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in the energy critical setting is some uh, easy cases where you, the, the situation below the ground state is pretty much understood for the energy critical wave equation uh, through works of Merrill and myself, Kilip and Visan and, and Dodson. Uh, now one should go an epsilon above the ground state and be in the radial case and see if one can find some hidden channel to understand that situation. Thank you. Any other question or comments? Okay, thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, thank you a lot, Professor Carlos Kenny, for an amazing talk. <laughs>